Okay, let's begin. First of all, welcome to this, the third in the series of Jean Monnet lectures this year. And I'm uh, delighted to see so many of you uh, turning up. But maybe it's something to do with the guy behind me rather than me. Uh, uh, and because I'm sure a lot of you will know something about our speaker for tonight. Uh, I wanted at the end to say something about the reason why we're not having a fourth lecture. Most years we have a fourth lecture, but this year we're holding a rather special event on Monday the 28th of April, which a lot of you will have heard about, and if you haven't, you should have. Uh, and I wanted to say a little bit about that uh, at the end, but I didn't want to say that now. I wanted instead to um, introduce uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Simon Hicks. Uh, there are some things that you need to know about Simon. First of all, Simon began uh, as a trainee uh, in the Socialist Group of the European Parliament, and that was when I first met him in the 1990s. But he has risen to greater things and has become Professor of European and Comparative Politics at the London School of Economics, and a name that uh, uh, trips off uh, every time when people talk about the European Union. Um, and uh, who's also become a, uh, he told me, a fellow of the British Academy. Uh, now, you might ask, what does that mean? And he told me the most important thing you need to know if you're a member of a fellow of the British Academy is that when you go to the meetings, the discussion is about who else should become a fellow of the British <laughs> Academy. Uh, so, uh, heaven knows what else they do, but anyway, that's one of uh, I suspect a lot of you have read uh, books that uh, Simon has written, uh, including the third edition of the political system of the European Union. Uh, and indeed, my favourite, uh, which goes back now to 2008, but I still think is well worth the read, and that is What's Wrong with the European Union and How Should We Fix It? It remains for me one of the best reads I've ever had on a plane crossing the Atlantic. It was great, I can really recommend it, and actually, as Simon may pick up, it's something, uh, uh, part of the, the theme of this evening is something that he already had uh, honed in on in that particular uh, book. Uh, Simon, though, has done lots of other things other than write books and give lectures to generation, well, generations, generations perhaps too far, a lot of LSE students. Um, he is one of the people who founded um, Vote Watch, which is the system by which you can find out uh, how members of the European Parliament have voted on individual pieces of legislation. So in the train coming here from Brussels this afternoon, we discussed whether Giva Hofstadt was in favour or against a financial transaction tax. And thanks to Vote Watch, we now know, we weren't sure, we now can tell you that he voted against it. Uh, he is not in favour of a financial transaction tax. So um, it's proved to be a remarkably good tool in making the European Union more transparent, which is one of the reasons why quite a lot of people don't like it. Uh, and, uh, but I think it's a great tool. Uh, and alongside it, uh, Simon will talk about it tonight, uh, Simon has set up something called Poll Watch, which is producing every two weeks a prediction as to what will happen in the European elections. Uh, he will tell you more about it, but I think both of these are contributions not just to the academic world, but to a wider, uh, the wider discussion of European affairs. Because as you will probably know, one of Simon's particular interests is trying to illustrate that the European Union has uh, a, has within it a, the development of a political system with political differences and uh, political uh, divergences. And indeed, not only does it have those that people often overlook, it should have more of them. That the European Union will succeed if it is more a more political, more politicised thing. 
uh, something which uh, uh, when Mr. Barroso met Simon, because Simon meets lots of much more important people than me, uh, Mr. Barroso said to him, but you don't understand Simon, the European Union, there's no politics in the European Union. Uh, one of Simon's basic missions in life is to show that Jose Manuel Barroso was wrong. <laughs> the format will be as usual. Uh, Simon will speak for roughly 45 to 50 minutes, after which, with such an august audience, I'm sure you will be able to bombard him with questions of the usual high mastery quality. So with that, <laughs> over to you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. My first visit to Maastricht, unbelievably. Um, what I'm going to talk about is what is at stake in these elections coming up in May. And I'll say a little bit about why these elections are not usually about Europe. I'll say a bit about why some of us think this time around it might be different. I'll talk a bit about our forecast for what we think is going to happen in May, and then talk about how that might feed through the choice of the next Commission President, the backing for the Commission President, which of course uh, will be relevant here in Maastricht, as you'll hear. Uh, and then I'll talk about potential policy implications um, for some key policy issues that are coming up in the next European Parliament in the next five years in the EU. So, from political scientists, um, European elections aren't really very much about Europe. It's a bit of a re re revelation in 1979, and the nice story is that uh, Karl Heinz Reif and Hermann Schmidt, these two German political scientists at Mannheim, called a meeting in Mannheim of political scientists from across Europe to come and analyze the elections after the elections. And, and Hermann told me the story. He said, so I think it was a French guy, the French guy stood up first, and he said, of course it was different in France, because uh, we were having the presidential elections in two years' time, and we're thinking the socialists might win, so everyone was focused on the French presidential election, so it was all about domestic politics. Uh, but that's because France is unique. And then the Brits stood up and said, well, of course it's different in Britain, because uh, we've just had the general election, and Margaret Thatcher has just won it, and so it's, uh, everyone's focused on the, the general election in Britain, and so of course it had nothing to do with Europe. He said they went around the table to all of the political scientists from all the member states, they all had exactly the same story. Oh, of course, it's completely unique in my country. It was all about domestic politics, nothing to do with Europe. And so they coined this phrase, European Parliament elections, the second order national election. Second order meaning not as important as first order, and national elections, meaning they're not really European elections. They're mid-term national contests in a national election cycle, which has two effects. The first effect is you get a lower turnout. You get uh, people thinking, these are not important elections, I don't need to bother voting because it doesn't really matter, so you get lower turnout. The second thing that happens is you get a different outcome in these elections than if it were a first order, an important election. Voters go out and they punish their national part, their big national parties, and particularly parties in government. And voters go out and vote for protest groups or to signal their policy preferences on things by voting for the Greens or voting for an anti-immigration party or something. They want to tell policymakers these are the issues they care about. And so we've seen lower turnout in European Parliament elections, so that's European Parliament electoral turnout compared to the average previous general election turnout in each of the EU member states. And what you can see, I think there's a point in there. Yeah. What you can see is that national Turnout has fallen. European Parliament election turnout has also fallen to just below 45% in the last elections. The gap remains about the same, about 20%. Turnout varies enormously across country in the European Parliament elections. So Belgium, where national elections are held on the same day, 90% turnout. In Luxembourg, 90% turnout. Right down to Slovakia in the last elections, it's 18%. Denmark, a big jump from 2004 to 2009. Wow, Europe must have mattered a lot. No, they had a referendum on the same day about whether the monarchy could be handed over to, to a daughter ahead of a son for the first time, and that's what got these people to go and vote. Turnout, there's way too much obsession on turnout. Turnout varies enormously in elections, all to do with what else is happening on the same day, what the weather's like. <coughs> Uh, whether it's a high stakes election, how close the vote's going to be, turnout varies hugely. So I've no idea whether turnout's going to go up or down in these European Parliament elections coming out. And quite frankly, I don't really care. Um, what's more important is who people vote for when they do go out and vote. 
And this is what happens normally in European Parliament elections. So here you can see this is averaged across all European Parliament elections in all EU member states since 79. Um, so here this is just plotting the average performance of parties in government compared to parties in opposition, given map just mapping what their vote was in the previous national election to whether they gained or lost votes in the subsequent European election. So if you're a big party in government, around 30 or 40 percent of the vote, you lose around 10 percent of your votes in the European Parliament election. If you're a big opposition party, you lose around 2 or 3 percent. If you're a medium-sized opposition party, you gain votes. If you're a small party, you gain lots of votes. So small parties with around 5, 6, 7 percent of the vote, they're gaining 2 or 3 percent. So they're gaining almost 50 percent increase in their vote share. So you're going to swing away from big governing parties, so swing away from big opposition parties to small parties. So it's got nothing to do with your midterm protest against national parties. In a sense, European Parliament elections turned out to have failed. There was a big optimism in 79 that this would create European wide democracy. And it's been a big disappointment to, to scholars at that time who thought this was going to happen. Something different happened though in, 19, in the last election. For the first time, we saw a European-wide phenomenon in these elections that we'd never seen before. And this was a European-wide swing against the socialists in the midst of the end of the crisis. So socialist parties, regardless of whether they're in government or opposition, lost votes. All the other major party families, if you were in opposition, you gained votes. If you are in government, you lost votes. Socialist parties in government lost around 10% votes. In opposition, they also lost votes. So in a sense, this was the first time there was a swing, a European-wide phenomenon. Very little to do, you can argue, with the EU, or people going around voting on European issues, but it was the first time we saw a European-wide phenomenon in these elections. But this time, people are saying, Europe clearly matters far more than in any previous election. Europe is far more salient than it's ever been before. And this is largely to do with the politics of the way the EU has reacted to the Eurozone crisis, austerity uh, imposed from Brussels if you're in Southern Europe, or bailouts to lazy Southern Europeans if you're in Northern Europe, and you can see growing protests against the how the EU has tried to resolve uh, the Eurozone crisis, both in Southern Europe and Northern Europe. Plus, growing anti-EU migration sentiment in a large number of member states, not just the UK, but also growing in Scandinavia, the Benelux, and now even in Germany and Austria. The other element to the, to, of the elections which is new is we now have rival candidates for the Commission President before the elections. We thought this might happen in 2009, it didn't happen. It's happened this time, it's happened because of the Lisbon Treaty, which I'm going to talk about. Let me talk a little bit about the rise, what, uh, rise of salience of, of means across Europe. So firstly, we're seeing, looking at the polls, the latest opinion polls, voting intentions across the EU member states, we're seeing a rise in the Eurosceptic populist right, mainly in Northern Europe. So these are some of the member states here. And you can see quite dramatic increase in support for parties on the radical right. So UKIP in the UK running around 25% of the polls, currently second, good. The most recent opinion poll happened first, the Party of Labour. Uh, Danish People's Party running second in Denmark. New Flemish Alliance, you can say they're Greens. Well, actually, they're not really Greens. They're more Eurosceptic than that. They could well sit in the European Conservative and Reformist group with the British Conservatives. Front National in France just did very well in local elections in France, running second in the national opinion polls at the moment. True Finns running third in Finland, Wilders in, in the Netherlands topping the polls. No party in Holland has more than 17% of the votes. 11 parties like to win seats in the European elections in Holland. Huge fragmentation of the vote here in the Netherlands. Uh, Jobbik, extreme, very extreme right party, 16%. Lithuania, a pretty Eurosceptic party on 16 Swedish Democrats for the first time in Sweden. Radical right party is probably going to win a seat. Golden Dawn, neo-Nazis in, in Greece, right, 9%, alternative to Deutschland. You can argue not radical right, but you're a skeptic, anti-bailouts, and growing now, party now coming out in favour of restricting EU free movement. <coughs> Big variation in these parties. So, you know, uh, 
Front National and uh, Wilders are saying, no, we're not as extreme as your making Golden Dawn. And then uh, UKIP saying, no, we're not as extreme as the Front National. And the alternative for Deutschland saying, no, we're not as extreme as Nigel Farage in the UK. So they're all trying to pretend they're not as extreme as each other, except Golden Dawn and York, because they're quite happy to be completely loose. <laughs> But it means there's going to be a rise in support for the radical right in the next European Parliament. I'll come back to this. We're also seeing growth in support for the radical left, <coughs> in opposition to austerity being imposed from Brussels. So Syriza topping the polls in Greece, now the number one party opposed to the austerity being imposed on Greece. Sinn Féin in Ireland, I'm the third in Ireland, an anti-EU, anti-austerity in Ireland party, communists in the Czech Republic, the Isgredo Unida, the, the radical left in, in Spain, up from 4% five years ago to 13% in the latest polls. Portuguese, always, radical left always do pretty well. They're standing where they were about four years ago. Front de Gauche in France, almost standing double to where they were five years ago. In Italy, a brand new group formed two, two weeks ago, Tsipras list, now starting to appear in the polls. This will probably pick up. They could get 6, 7, 8, 9% by the time of the election. So this is what our current prediction is. Um, another one, the new one will be uh, a week on Wednesday, it'll go live. So what we do is we take all the latest opinion polls from across Europe, from electionists, there is just a Twitter feed that, that, that tweets all the latest polling data. Uh, we just pull the polling data from each of the member states. If it's a European Parliament poll, so how will you vote tomorrow if the European Parliament election was held tomorrow? Uh, we just take an average of those polls for a country. If some countries have not had European Parliament election polls yet, <coughs> they, just, they just have, how would you vote if there was a general election held tomorrow? And for those, what we do is we apply a model that, that corrects those polls. So we assume from studying all previous elections, or polls in all previous elections, what we know is that general election polls overestimate support for governing parties and underestimate support for small opposition parties. So we just apply the model we have from the previous election to those national election polls, and then we predict vote shares in every member state, and from those vote shares in every member state, we then calculate seat shares. And we're doing that up to the election. So what you can see, that's our latest prediction, the two biggest groups neck and neck. Um, what's perhaps more interesting is comparing it to the current parliament. So here's the outgoing parliament, here's the latest forecast for, uh, for the incoming parliament. Socialist group getting bigger, the EPP group getting smaller, a rise in the radical left, and a big rise in support for parties over here on the right. So this is the European Conservative Reformists, this is UKIP's EFD, and this is this motley crew of currently not attached, because they're not attached to any group. There will probably be enough MEPs from enough member states for Wilders and Le Pen to form a new group. They need at least 25 MEPs from at least seven member states. They should be able to get that. There's a few parties in here that are not radical right. So two in particular. One is the Five Star Movement in Italy, probably going to come second in the polls in Italy. No idea where they're going to go. Uh, the Greens say they're going to sit with the Greens. The Liberals say they're going to sit with the Liberals. The EPP say they're going to sit with the EPP. No, knows where they're going to go. Uh, actually, Nigel Farage would like to sit with uh, Pepe Grindel, he told an audience at the LAC two weeks ago. Uh, and the other group in here is the Czech AMO, a new movement in the Czech Republic, leading the polls in the Czech Republic. The Liberals in the European Parliament are lobbying us to put them in the Liberal group. The EPP are lobbying us to put them in the EPP group, and the parties keeping Sturm until after the election. So, so there's about 25 here are not radical right. But even if you take that off, you've got a large block of MEPs to the right of the mainstream centre-right in Europe and a rise in support <coughs> to the left over here, and in a sense a squeezed middle. So the first thing that will happen after the elections is going to be the choice of the Commission President. So the Lisbon Treaty introduced a new method for choosing the Commission President. Here's the paragraph 7, article 17. The treaty says, taking into account the elections of the European Parliament, and after having held the appropriate consultations, the European Council, acted by a qualified majority, shall propose to the European Parliament to candidate for President of the Commission. So the new bit here is taking into account the elections for the European Parliament. This candidate shall be elected by the European Parliament. That's new wording. 
elected by the European Parliament, by a majority of its component members. That doesn't mean just a simple majority, that means a majority of 751. If it does not obtain a required majority, the European Council has no or if majority shall within one month propose a new candidate who should be elected by the European Parliament following the same procedure. So there's two readings of this, two interpretations of this. One interpretation is the interpretation that the British government had, although it's now realising not everybody else agrees with them, they're very surprised to find out. Their interpretation is this is no change from the previous treaty. It's exactly the same. The count, European Council meets at the level of the heads of government and by qualified majority they propose the person who's going to be Commission President and the European Parliament votes on that person and if they reject them we just propose somebody else and we keep going until they accept who we propose to. If you're the leaders of the groups in the European Parliament or in particular Klaus Vela, Secretary General of the European Parliament, his interpretation is the following. It says we elect the, the Commission President and you, heads of government, have to basically pick the person from the largest group in the European Parliament. Because if you don't, we're not going to vote for you. And we're going to get all the groups to pre-commit to that. And when the British government said that's not what the treaty says, he says, doesn't it say in Britain that the Queen chooses who the Prime Minister is? <laughs> so the Queen chooses the Prime Minister, and then the Queen has to choose the Prime Minister of the largest party in the House of Commons, right? And of course, then they can't argue against that, and then so he just says, the heads of government in the council are just like the Queen. They're just the person who's from the largest group in Europe. So you can see completely different interpretation. So to kind of push the hands of the governments, the main groups in the European Parliament, led by the socialists, nominated lead candidates then for the European elections. And Schultz, the current president of the European Parliament, very cleverly engineered that he would be the lead candidate for the Socialists, but then forced the others to come up with their lead candidates uh, against him. So here we have Schultz, the, as the Germans are calling them, Spitzenkandidaten, which is lead candidates, which is a bit unfortunate, because it would be much better if they were called commission president candidates. Lead candidates is a problem for sitting prime ministers. Sitting Prime Ministers do not want to put their names forward for this because they have to be candidates to be MEPs. So these are all candidates to be MEPs and then if they become Commission President they're no longer MEPs, they're now the Commission President. <coughs> Whereas what you could have is to say we put rival candidates for Commission President and then the groups just vote on these. So by interpreting this as lead candidates for the European Parliament is deliberately confusing whether this is a lead candidate for the European White Parliament campaign or whether this is the real candidate for the Commission President. So for Hofstadt, for the Liberals, Juncker uh, sort of reluctantly has been press ganged into being put forward as the lead candidate for the EPP. He's said on multiple occasions up to now he really, really doesn't want the job. <laughs> um, surprisingly, at the last minute in the EPP summit meeting, all the other people who really did want the job suddenly withdrew so that he could become the lead candidate of the EPP. Welcome to the politics of the EPP group. <laughs> Over here, Alexis Tsipras, the leader of Shiritsa in, in Greece, is the candidate of the European left, supported by the GUE group. And down here, the Greens love to have two candidates, Scott Keller and Joseph Rovais. They had an open primary. Anybody could register to vote in an open I voted in Greens open primary. <laughs> Just have to say, do you agree with green ish, you know, a kind of a little vague statements about would you like the environment to be clean? Yeah, sure. <laughs> then you can go and vote in the green primary. So I voted in the green primary. Uh, I think I could see three for three various processes to elect the police. So anyway. Uh, the two I voted for didn't get elected, but these two did. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting. Finally, we have a woman candidate. Which is quite interesting, and I think a lot of people will, will want her as part of the various claims. But will they be different? This is one thing the British press is like to, is currently going around saying, well, Schultz and Juncker and Verhofstadt, they're all the same, they're Euro Federalists, there's no difference between them. Um, so what's going to be very interesting between now and the elections is to see if there is going to be any difference between them. And so what I tried to think about on the train over with Michael was. Are, do they have any different policy positions on any key issues? 
Deeper economic and monetary union, for example, euro bonds. Well, it's, quite, it's clear that it looks like all of them are in favor of this. Bear in mind that you're going to have a rising, rising radical right and a rising radical left, both opposed to this sort of deeper economic and monetary union. All of these candidates, including Cyprus on the left here, probably in favor of euro bonds. Financial transactions tax, we looked up the voting record of Verhofstadt on the FTT, on the Vote Watch app, on the train on the way over. And he's against, Juncker probably against, the other three in favour, so here is a left-right split. Limiting free movement of people. This is not about changing the rules, the actual treaty provisions, but this is more growing support in a number of member states for restricting access of EU migrants to welfare benefits for six months or 12 months. This is what the British government is currently doing. It's being challenged in the European Court of Justice. The British government, before the European Court of Justice, six other EU governments are backing the position of the British government before the ECJ. And this is now most candidates for the European Parliament in Denmark, where it's open list voting, you vote for individual candidates, have actually signed up to a pledge saying they're opposed to providing welfare benefits to EU migrants until there's the time limit. And it's growing across Europe. So this is a growing issue in the UK, Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, and Austria. None of these candidates, I think, would consider any movement from the States as well. EU-US free trade agreement. Probably a left-right split when you look at the voting patterns in the last European Parliament on the EU-Korea free trade agreement, for example. The left and the Greens voted against the EU-Korea free trade agreement. Most of the socialists the Liberals and the EPP voted in favour. Services liberalisation. This is another issue the Commission has been talking about. We need to generate growth in the new economy, in the, in the economy in Europe. The way to do that is to free up small and medium-sized enterprises in Europe, particularly in the services sector. It's not clear that anybody would be in favour of this except for Hofstadt. CAC form. Hard to know what the positions of these guys are. They may be split. I can imagine Scott Keller having a different view to Joseph Bouvet when it comes to farmers. Uh, Schultz and Verhofstadt, in their statement so far, are saying they're in favour of reforming the camp, reducing public spending on agricultural subsidies. Juncker opposed the camp reform. Single seat for the European Parliament, quite interestingly. The Liberals in their manifesto for the European elections are in favour of are the first European party to openly come out in favour of them no longer having the European Parliament schlepping from Brussels down to Strasbourg. If you want to get anyone wild up about this, talk to one. <laughs> Who will win? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, right now you could just say, look, if it's going to become a straight shot between Schultz and Juncker, um, Juncker's probably slightly ahead. If you think that the Socialists, the Greens and GUI might back Schultz, the EPP, Aldi and the ECR, that's the European Conservatives and Reformists, might back Juncker, Juncker's marginally ahead, but there's a lot of others we don't know about. Also, it's not clear that Aldi will back Juncker. After we posted this on a blog on our website, we were inundated with emails from uh, officials in the Aldi group saying, uh, well, there's no way we're going to back Juncker. We're definitely going to back Schultz, to which I forwarded it to somebody else in the Aldi administration. They went, there's no way we're going to back Schultz. We're definitely going to back Juncker. <laughs> so they're probably going to split. Will the ECR support Juncker? The British Conservatives, are, are, they're going to abstain. They don't want to support any of them. They're all Euro-Federalists. We can't stand any of them. They're Cameron's strategy is to try and block all of them and have somebody else imposed on the European Parliament. He seems to think he has a veto on the Council. He doesn't. It's quite a very good veto. British Labour Party is now talking about leaving the Party of European Socialists because the Party of European Socialists has backed Schultz and the British Labour Party has refused to support it. And it's got so bad, the argument between Schultz and Ed Miliband. Ed Miliband has made him pledge not to come to Britain during the election campaign. Um, so he's not coming to Britain. So Ed Miliband can just pretend the election's not going on. Because he knows he's going to do bad. <laughs> and what will these guys do? We have no idea. ANO may back uh, Juncker. Who knows what's going to happen to the to the, uh, to, to Becky Grillo and these guys. Could Verhofstadt emerge as the kingmaker in a deal? Could he come along and say, 
I'll tell you what, Schultz or Juncker, uh, Martin or John claude um, you give me one of these other big portfolios in the Commission, um, and I'm willing to back you uh, to be um, get Aldi my troops behind you, and that could swing in favour of, of you getting your majority in the European Parliament. Or will there be a deal broken in Berlin? Berlin, of course, the German government right now is a grand coalition. I always like to think that, I always like to say that whatever the government is in Berlin is a long shadow on the European Parliament. Because the parties in Berlin tend to be the biggest parties in their respective political groups in the European Parliament. So when you had a SPD Green coalition in Berlin, you tended to get a lot of deals in Brussels between the, SPD, between the Socialists and the Greens. When you had a CDU FPP coalition in, in Berlin, you tended to get a lot of deals between the EPP and Aldi in the European Parliament. Now you have a grand coalition in Berlin. Last time we had a grand coalition in Berlin, we had deals between EPP and Socialists on a lot of issues, for example, the watering down of the services directive. Um, we could again, with a grand coalition in Berlin, see a deal that says, we're going to do a deal between these two groups, and actually the squeezing of those two groups by the emergence of the extremes is going to force those two groups to vote together anyway on a new package deal, not just on the choice of the Commission President, but also on all the new legislative packages that are going to be coming along. So here's some arguments that suggest that Schultz or Juncker might actually sneak through and become Commission President. Some people are saying the first thing that's going to happen after the elections is there's going to be a summit meeting of the heads of government. And it's not going to be clear at that time who's the largest group in the European Parliament. It's going to be too early. Until there's actually the first plenary session of the European Parliament, they're not actually going to know whether the Socialists or the EPP are the largest group because there's going to be lots of new parties and we don't know where they're going. To be going. And we don't know what other deals are going to be going on. So there's a good chance that Europe, that first European Council summit meeting will not come up with a candidate. And there'll be pressure to wait and see what the groups are in the European Parliament. Which could very well mean that the European Parliament's going to go first. And they could well vote. Formally, the treaties say the governments will nominate somebody and then the European Parliament will elect them. But the treaties say the European Parliament will nominate somebody having consulted the European Parliament. And then the European Parliament will elect them. Well, any time the government, the treaty has ever said consult the European Parliament, the European Parliament says consult, what does that mean? Oh, that means you have to vote. So they're going to vote. Of course they're going to vote. They're a parliament. That's what they do. So, I mean, they're going to vote. In that first plenary, there will be a vote on who the Commission President is going to be. They're going to be desperate to get to press those buttons. So, there will be a vote. And if they vote, can you imagine if they vote and somebody then has a an absolute majority in the European Parliament, the council's going to come along and say, no, we don't like that person. We have somebody different. It's going to be very different. Key governments in Europe, particularly the German governments, are going to be very reluctant to go against what is widely perceived as, for the first time, some sort of quasi-democratic process with rival candidates and a debate and a battle to choose the Commission president. The German government is living in fear of its constitutional court. The constitutional court in Germany is, is repeatedly saying, we don't think the EU is democratic enough, and until there is genuinely democratic politics in the EU, we don't think that any more power should go to Brussels. And so they need to demonstrate that, that the EU is democratic, and so they'll be desperate to show, look, there was a battle, and the one person who won that democratic battle became the Commission President. See, court, the EU is democratic. <laughs> a grand coalition, as I said. The other thing that people are already now starting to say is, well, you know, Commission President isn't as powerful as it used to be. Actually, there's this Council President, so that's quite an important job, particularly when it comes to economic and monetary union. And the Commission President is not really the first among equals, like a Prime Minister is in his or her cabinet at home. He's just really the chair of the College of Commissioners. And he doesn't really have influence over other key portfolios. It's who really is going to be the most powerful people in the Commission? It's going to be the the EMU Commissioner, the Trade Commissioner negotiating TTIP with the US, the Competition Commissioner, the Internal Market Commissioner, who's going to be dealing with services liberalisation, the next phase of services liberalisation, and so on, or regulation of financial services. So they could easily say, well, we'll let Schultz or Juncker be Commission President, because we know it's not really that important anymore, and we'll focus on 
a deal on all of these other posts. So that's a kind of set of ideas that suggest one or other of these two could actually emerge as commissioners. Here's some arguments to say are very unlikely. Schultz and Juncker are unacceptable to several governments. Several governments have openly come out and said, we don't want either of these people. Um, UK, Sweden are also suggesting that if there's enough governments that, that can form a blocking minority in the council, this would be very difficult to get any of them through the European Council. A lot of people are talking about some other names who didn't put their names forward to be spits in the kind of them. Christine Lagarde, of course, being talked about. The Economist came out very strongly in favour of her. She's also being talked about in some other press, including in Germany and in France. Big problem for Christine, of course, is the French government don't want her, and she'd be the French commissioner. Um, French socialist government would have a real problem choosing a UNP member to be commission president. Helen Dorning Schmidt is talked about everywhere in the EU, except in Denmark, as the next commission president. <laughs> You guys want to be commission president. So if the EPP are the largest group in the European Parliament, that's a bit of a problem. Because Juncker's already said he'd much rather be president of the European Council than I don't want to be commission president, he says. Um, so this could be lining him up. Is he the is he a stool pigeon, for example, for, for who really the EPP have in mind? We don't know yet who the EPP really have in mind for commission president. I hope it doesn't emerged that actually all the way along they've been thinking of somebody else to be commission president and just waiting for this nonsense of European Parliament elections to go on before they then choose who this person is going to be. Of course there's a recognition that the Lisbon procedure and the, the lead candidates this time round has not really worked the way it perhaps could have done and what they could do is say look we messed it up this time. You know, but we kind of pre-commit to the fact we're going to do it properly next time round and so let's just Forget this whole charade this time around, and then we'll have some proper potential commission presidents from big countries, some really European wide politicians who could potentially be the presidents of Europe, and we'll do that properly in five years' time, and we'll just agree that this time around we messed it up. The other thing people are saying is the governments really do not want to be bullied by the European Parliament. They've had enough of being bullied by the European Parliament over the last five years and they're not going to take it anymore and this is their last chance to say they want to set the, tra the train for the next five years, we're not going to let the European Parliament bully us. They bullied us on takeovers, they bullied us on, on the services directive, they're bullying us on the financial transactions tax, they bullied us on ACTA and we're not going to take it anymore. <coughs> so what are the potential policy implications of <coughs> what could happen in these elections. So if we end up with around 200 MEPs who you could really describe as anti-federalist, populist, anti-deeper European integration on both the radical right and the radical left. This is a bloc that has several things in common. Firstly, they're very anti-big business, anti um, financial services industry, anti-globalized businesses and so both from the right who tend to be a kind of populist right against the guys who run the show and an anti-european radical left this could make it very difficult for some of the major big industries in Brussels who currently have big influence over how the single market is regulated. They're also united in their opposition to deep economic and monetary union. The populist right are opposed to more bailouts. They don't want more money being committed to the European Stability Mechanism. They don't want Euro bonds. The populist left are opposed to austerity, the Fiscal Compact Treaty, the Euro Plus Pact, and all the measures to harmonise national macroeconomic policies, which they see as very anti-democratic and imposing austerity from Brussels and Berlin. Put those two together, and it's going to be very difficult to get another set of um, economic and monetary union related legislation passed and I have an example. So this is from vote watch data, this was a vote in the last parliament on one of the key elements of the six pack which was the rules governing uh, surveillance of, by the commission of the budgetary position of the member states. So this was a piece of legislation that then set up the architecture for the commission to then monitor national budgets. It passed by 354 votes to 269 
This was a centre-right coalition, Aldi and EPP, a few socialists, a few ECR. So I measure a rise in the radical left, a rise in the anti-Europeans, a rise in the EFD, a rise in non-attached, a rise in anti-European socialists, a decline in Aldi and a decline in EPP. This would be probably not, I, according to my calculations, I don't think this would pass. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot, it's going to be much more difficult, I think, for the governments and the Commission to get anything right to deeper economic monitoring. For example, the banking union, they're going to have to try and get that done before the Parliament breaks in May. If they fail to get it passed before May, and it rolls over to the next Parliament, I think it's going to be very difficult to get the banking union passed. Anti-free trade. Um, the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, which is a euphemism for an EU-US free trade agreement, um, is the biggest uh, package of free trade potentially coming to the European Parliament. The European Parliament now votes simple up and down on trade agreements just like the Senate does in the US. We saw a, a vote on the EU-Korea free trade agreement where we saw the left and the Greens opposed, the socialists split with Northern European Socialists voting in favour and Southern European Socialists and French voting against and some of the radical right voting against. Radical right is pro-free trade but tends to be quite anti-American. They, they were all in favour of the European Parliament throwing out the ACTA deal between the EU government and the US which was a deal on uh, data sharing and they threw it out for privacy concerns. They were sort of libertarian right, were opposed to the state interfering in our personal freedoms. And they see the US government and the NSA as a, a interfering in European lives, and they don't like that. The left don't like it either, and add to that, the left don't like free trade, and particularly don't like free trade with the US. Free trade might be okay in the developing world, but not okay with the US. So you can see a growing anti-TTIP coalition inside the European Finally, growing support for rolling back some of the freedoms on the free movement of people amongst a large bloc, particularly Northwest European. And it's not that these groups in the European Parliament will have such a big majority they can force a majority vote in the European Parliament on these issues. It's more to do with think about what will mainstream centre-right parties in Northern Europe do in the next five years. So, British Conservatives, under pressure from UKIP, are now talking about changing free movement. The, I bet you the Dutch Liberals and Dutch Christian Democrats are going to start changing their policies on free movement. The parties in Belgium, already it's happening in Denmark. What about the Moderata in Sweden? And what even about the CDU in Germany? If we see a big vote for alternative for Deutschland and growing support within the, the CSU wing of the CDU, uh, in favour of changing the rights uh, for freedom of movement of people. I can see a new split emerging in the European Parliament within the EPP bloc, where you're going to see a growing segment of EPP being in favour of changing the current status quo on freedom of movement of people, particularly access to benefits. So how do we sum So in many member states, Europe is now more salient than it's ever been because of the Eurozone crisis, because of EU migration, and generally the salience of the question of Europe. Plus we have rival candidates for the Commission President. It's perhaps a bit early to say whether or not this is really going to change the campaigns between now and the elections. It will change the campaigns for people like Michael but, and me, but it won't really change it for most of the people out there on the streets. For most people in Europe, voting in these elections or not voting in these elections will ultimately be about domestic politics. We can't kid ourselves that these elections are now a fundamentally different set of European elections. They're not. At the margins, they will be a bit more about Europe than other European parties, actually, but still, overwhelmingly in every member state, they are about domestic politics, domestic parties, domestic political leaders, and how popular those parties are, and what the key issues at stake in those member states are. Looking across the polls right now, we see the EPP and the Socialists neck and neck and a growth in support for the radical right and the radical left, which is likely to force these two biggest groups together in the middle to form a grand coalition to do a deal on the Commission President and a deal on some of the other offices like the Council President, High Representative for Foreign Affairs, even NATO Secretary General and so on. And we will see growing support for a range of changes to current status quo policies. 
an opposition to deeper economic and monetary union, an opposition to continuing uh, free movement of people under the current rules, and potentially an opposition to transatlantic free trade. Thank you. situation as Simon sees it, and by no means everybody agrees with Simon about this, and what I'd like to do is to open it up to the audience to see what's on your mind. Uh, um, what feel free to be. So, yes, right at the back. How about just to say where you're from, because I was saying from all of Europe, so. Yes. Uh, good evening, my name is uh, Mr. Diaz, I'm from Germany, and I've got a question regarding the second immortal phenomenon. Uh -huh. Because uh, studies show that in the past, the parties also have treated the uh, elections as a second order issue, spending less money, and also the media has uh, not taken so much attention. But uh, yeah, I wonder whether you have indications that this year the parties actually invest more, so maybe to, live, to shift it to a first order election. For example, the Social Democrats are definitely in Germany interested to push Schultz. So are there any uh, indications for that? It's. Uh, my, what I can say is largely anecdotal. So I think there is evidence that, for example, German Social Democrats pushing Schultz. Um, but it's, you know, in France, the, the flip side of that is the classic thing is happening in France, which is Hollande knows that the French socialists are going to do appallingly badly in these elections. So they're just pretending they're not going on. They want to spend any money on them. They're hoping there's going to be a low turnout. They did terribly in the local elections. This weekend, and they're going to do awfully in the second round in two weeks. Then they've got the European elections coming. They're just hoping all these elections just go away. Uh, so that, that's often what happens with governing parties. Uh, you know, it's a little different in Germany because of Schultz, but it's hard to make that to, that as a general phenomenon. I, you know, I talked to some people who are standing as candidates in the UK, and they're just furious their parties are just, you know, not even covering these elections. Not even, I got a phone call from the BBC saying, I understand there's European elections coming up. <laughs> Do you know anything about these? <laughs> this is the person in charge of the BBC coverage of the I've got to go to Brussels next week, he said. Who can I talk to? I mean, this, you know, this... And, and that's not, not, you know, it's not... What's surprising to us is actually one indicator of the fact that these elections have not really captured the imagination in most member states is that in a lot of member states there haven't even been any opinion polls on European elections yet. We're only a couple of months away. And still the pollsters are obsessed with asking them, how are you going to vote if there are local elections tomorrow? Or how are you going to vote if there are general elections tomorrow? Only in a few member states who are actually get in polls saying, how are you going to vote in the European elections coming in May? So that's a kind of indication that it's not, in fact we had the first EP election poll in Germany last week, the first one for about four months we had, there only two in Germany. Um, in Italy now, they're, they're getting polls, four, five or six polls just doing polls every day on the internet. You have no idea whether to believe any of them. Going up there. <laughs> so you're getting lots of polls on Europe and everything. Uh, but in Eastern Europe, well, very few member states have polls on, on European Parliament elections, so we don't even know where, what's going on in the campaigns in those countries. Most of them are still having polls on how would you vote if it was a general election tomorrow. So that when you just look at it at that level, it's not clear to me that it's that different from five years ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my name is Annie Klick. I'm also from Germany. Uh, I have a question concerning this uh, rising populist movement that you were talking about. Um, well, of course, uh, Le Pen and Wilders are now planning to actually form this new group. Um, in Parliament, but my question is, what is so new about that? I mean, of course, we uh, there will be um, more votes in favor of these populist parties, but actually, we already have the EFD and the EP right now. So, what exactly is? And I know that uh, Farage, for example, as you also mentioned, doesn't want to work together with uh, with Wilders and the Pen. 
But what actually, actually is the distinction between these two groups then when they're established? And I mean, why is this really new? Well, I think what's new is, in, is two senses. One is these were formerly far more radical right parties than they are now. Both of those two, and most parties on the radical right, with the exception of Golden Dawn and Jobbik and Attacker and Bogare and a few others, most of them are now saying, we are mainstream parties. They didn't used to say that, but now they are. The leaders have a strategy of saying we're mainstream parties. We're opposed to the established parties. They all look the same. They're all from the same social milieu. They all went to the same schools. They all live in the same arrondissement or same <coughs> suburbs of the Hague. Um, and you know, we are against that, that group. So vote for us if you're if you're disgruntled with the direction that politics is taking. That's different to ten years ago when the, part, the radical right parties were just saying vote for us if you don't like foreigners. Which which is yeah, a very different shift. And you can see Marine Le Pen has a completely different strategy to her father in making this a mainstream party. Wilders is trying to do the same. You kept the rhetoric is almost identical. He says, I'm not a racist, I'm not opposed. In fact, he was more in favour of Britain accepting asylum seekers from Syria than the government was. He said, Britain has a great tradition of asylum seekers. We should blame as not lots of asylum seekers from Syria. Um, I just don't want people coming here as economic migrants just because we can give them free, you know, cheap benefits. And so we need to clamp down on that. So, and he's kicking people out of his party who are making racist statements. The Conservatives aren't kicking people out of the party who are making racist statements. He is. And he likes to go around pointing that out, actually, to the embarrassment of the Conservative Party. Um, so, you know, the rhetoric is different, and the volume of support is different. We've never seen this sort of level of support for this sort of populist right. I, mean, I wouldn't, I, I don't deliberately don't want to put extreme right. It's not extreme right, it's the kind of populist right against the mainstream centre-right, which is, which is seen very much as in collusion with big global business, in collusion, you know, and, and not that different, the very little difference between the leaderships of the centre-left and the leadership of the centre-right in most countries in Europe. As epitomised by great coalitions. You know, so it, it's, it's, it, it is a different phenomenon we're seeing. It doesn't mean that we're in the 1930s. It's not nasty politics like that. But it's definitely a rise in a popular support. Part of this is driven, I think, by deeper social and economic phenomena, which is the which is growing economic inequality. We're seeing you know growing income inequality in Europe, higher, you know, much higher turnovers amongst higher income voters in society. We're seeing very highly paid public sector workers voting for social democrats, very highly paid private sector workers voting for the Liberals or the Christian Democrats. They get into power and do pretty much the same thing. And then there's a lower class of voters who are either unemployed or underemployed or in rural areas who are losing their jobs or are declining industrial areas. That, that are the bedrock of support for these protest parties. Whether that's Grillo in Italy or Le Pen in France or Wilders in Holland or, or Farage in Britain, it's the same kind of milieu, social milieu of voters supporting these parties. We're not seeing it quite so strongly yet in Germany. But, but, but I think alternative for Deutschland have an element of it that they're kind of appealing to. Not quite the same, but an element. And it's the same phenomenon with the truth in Finland, and the Danish People's Party in Denmark, and the Swedish Democrats in Sweden. All across Europe you're seeing that kind of politics. So that's what I think is new about this new populist right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, hi, I'm Natalie, I'm from Luxembourg, and I basically have a question of clarification. Why do you say that this term of Spitzenkandidaten is actually detriment to prime ministers putting their name in vain? Because a lead candidate suggests a candidate to be elected to a parliament. But, uh, um, and there's nothing that says that you have to be a candidate for a parliament to be the head of an executive. I mean, there's nothing particularly in the EU that says, in fact, you cannot be an AP and be commission president. So you have to resign your seat. So it's very much a model of European Commission President selection modeled on a particular version of parliamentary democracy. Um, there was nothing that you could easily have said, we have candidates for the Commission President. They're not standing as candidates to the MEPs. But that's not what they've done. What they've said is they've got to be candidates for, and they've got to be candidates to the MEPs. The lead candidate to be an MEP is what Spitzenkandidaten means in a kind of German conception. Hence why. It was very difficult to try and get, for example, Helen Schmidt to, to put her name forward, or 
Or if Barnier was going to be the candidate in France, then would he have to be the, a UNP candidate to be elected to the European Parliament to be able to be the lead candidate of the European Parliament? Then I don't understand exactly this point. Why can Juncker then not be candidate for... So he's not a candidate. So he's, he's against the exception here. He's, he's not a candidate. Well, yeah. So he's spitting kind of out and without being a candidate for the European Parliament. Yeah. That's why the UNP are really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Because they've been saying all along that spits and candidates means you can't have sitting prime ministers because they'd have to then be candidates to the European Parliament, and then, yet yeah, they've picked somebody exactly for that situation. Yes, the fact. Hi, I'm Eric, I'm from the Czech Republic. And um, in one of the previous uh, lectures held here, we had, um, we had a guy talking about the Act React Impact campaign. And I was wondering if you think that this campaign will make any measurable effect on the upcoming elections, and in fact, that it can have an impact. Never heard of it. Next <laughs> <laughs> <Last> question. <laughs> no, I know, it's the European part. I mean, come on, it's, it's, you know, I wonder how many, pe how many people across Europe have heard anything about this. Very few. I mean, the, the European part, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if it's more than two, three thousand, a continent of 500 million. So I'm really, you know, it's, it's not the European Parliament's fault. It's, you know, uh, it, people uh, get fired up and engaged in an election if it's a battle for executive office. So I think this is a start. If this really was a battle between some big high profile figures, and there was a big difference between these figures, then I think it would be more, I think in time it can evolve into that. But people get out to vote to mobilize in elections if there's really something at stake. Just look at US presidential elections and US congressional elections. <clears throat> Turnout drops by 25% in a midterm congressional election because people are just voting for Congress. And it goes up again for US presidential elections. It's going to zigzag. So, I mean, you know, you're not going to get people being mobilized and turning up to vote unless it really, really matters. For most voters, I mean, the part, does it really matter who these guys are as commission president? really make a difference? They're all the same, they all want the same stuff, they all look the same, sound the same. <laughs> yes, yes. In, uh, yeah. yes. Uh, what do you think, uh, how do you think uh, the candidates <laughs> yeah, yeah, I meant so, but it's fine, it's fine. You don't know, yeah. you yeah. so yeah. take a couple, go on. Yeah, it's fine, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You started, so <laughs> yeah, You started, uh, sorry. What do you think uh, the reaction will be, uh, the European Parliament, to the rise of separatist groups around Europe, such as in Scotland and also and, uh... Yeah, they've had this in the past. So, so regionalist parties or separatist parties have always historically done well in European Parliament elections as a protest. But so, so it's, in that sense, it's not that it's not that new. So it's, it doesn't really change that much. And in the overall scheme of things, in terms of number of seats in the Parliament, <coughs> they don't actually represent such a significant block. And they're split between most of them who sit with the Greens, the sort of social democratic. Separatists, and then you get a more conservative separatist, a lot of them sitting in the UPP. So the Spanish coalition for Europe splits when it gets to the European Parliament. Some sit with the Liberals and some sit with the UPP. And then there's another coalition of regionalists who sit in the Greens. So, so it doesn't have that much of an impact on the campaign. Whether or not we're going to have Scottish independence is a separate question. <laughs> I'll have a discuss if you're interested. Yeah. Um, my name is Ibiza, and I'm from Germany, but also half Italian, so quite a big um, and um, I wanted to ask, um, because I was wondering, um, on the table, um, why for the Spitzenkandidaten, for example, at um, Skar Keller, there were twice a question, or three times a question mark. Is it because they didn't express clearly a position, or...? It's more my ignorance. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I was looking around. I don't, you know, we haven't really seen... Now we've got statements from the political groups or the party families, manifestos for these European elections. We haven't yet got manifestos from the candidates themselves. And it's difficult with Keller and Beauvais in that you can think of them, for example, on the question of the single EP seat, the Greens in the Parliament in general are in favour of no longer going to Strasbourg. That is French. So, you know, they may well have different positions on this. Cap reform, the Greens in general, 
have, are in favour of reforming the cap, cutting the expenditure, and focusing the expenditure more on rural, environmental, ag agriculture, organic agriculture, and so on. But again, he's a French farmer. So, I, you know, so I, that's why I'm, you know, I, that's, that's why I have question marks there. <laughs> Economic monetary union, uh, uh, Europe bonds in particular, the Greens, uh, in general, if I oppose the deep economic monetary, but the group looks split itself in that some of the group voted in favour of Europe, the voting European Parliament on Europe bonds, for example. So, so, so that's more, a lot will have changed between now and the elections, and we may start to see, I was just trying to get you to think about, will we start to see the emergence of policy positions of these different candidates, what they actually represent, and when they start to articulate that during the campaign. Some of these things look like we kind of know where they stand, but a lot of this we don't yet really know where they stand. Some of these key issues for Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Laura Christine. I'm German, and um, I have a question concerning the German alternative for Germany, <laughs> because um, I'm wondering why this party, compared to other Eurosceptic European parties, emerged that late because it's a pretty young party. And I was wondering if there are any determining factors why this party. I think there's several factors. Sorry. There was a question, sorry, the question was, uh, why uh, Alternative for Deutschland as an, as an anti-European party, why did it emerge relatively late compared to a uh, lot of the other member states? Um, it emerged late, it emerged around a very particular issue. So most anti-European parties emerge either emerged originally either on the left, as in the Scandinavian anti-European parties in the 80s, or on the radical right, as in the anti-European parties in France and Britain and a few other parts of Europe, in Finland um, and in Denmark, Danish People's Party. Um, in Germany, you've got there's several factors that are really different. One is the mainstream German public opinion was very supportive of European integration, but not that supportive of economic and monetary union. So there wasn't generally a groundswell of potential popular opposition to Europe. European integration was seen as the same thing as German national interests, and, and anyway, given German history, Germany should be in favour of deeper political integration in Europe. But then there started to be questions about whether or not that also had to mean giving up the Deutsche Bank. And this started to grow in support amongst very articulate in economics professors in Germany, law professors saying this was in breach of the German Grundgesetz, um, and this discourse of why we didn't have to go this far, we've, why are we having to sign up to this stuff, this is in fundamental breach of German economic interests and German legal traditions. And so it came out of a completely different discourse. Add to that the decline of the FDP. The FDP was a party that was in coalition with the CDU and so quite constrained in, in, in being more critical of the, the plan, the bailout plans. Inside the FDP, the party was actually quite critical of Germany signing up to such an extent to the European Stability Mechanism, but wasn't able to come out so openly opposed to it. So I think you saw mainly an economic and a legal elite that was in favour, that was more critical of of Germany's role in deep economic and monetary union, and that then opened up into now a movement which has formed and now starting to raise a whole lot of other issues. And for the first time now, starting to talk for example about freedom of the people, which none of the mainstream parties in Germany would ever touch. So it's a different historical tradition, plus a different particular issue of economic and monetary union. Is that your kind of take, Michael? Actually, I hadn't really thought about it, but it, it seems as good a take as any. I'll take your take. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, thank you. Yes, my name is Thomas, I'm from Germany as well. <laughs> so, uh, just as a little footnote to what we just discussed, this um, Alternative for Deutschland, I wouldn't be too um, sort of excited about them at the moment. So we have had uh, similar parties before. Uh, think about ProDM, for instance, or um, also about platforms in which the Republicana uh, ran in earlier elections. Um, none of these parties were really ever sort of made it to any significant and also longer lasting uh, success in the election polls. Anyway, That's I true, but don't you think there is something a little different now? I mean, there's different about this party. That as with the uh, Republicana, I mean, this is far more of a mainstream 
political phenomenon of the public is, for example. Um, the European issue, particularly the bailout, the German role in the bailouts, is far more salient now than it's been in the past in Germany. And plus, the German Constitutional Court getting rid of the 3% threshold just encourages these parties to, to go and mobilise in these elections. It was 5% in previous European Parliament elections. Came down to 3%, now thrown out. So we're going to get the free voters are probably going to win a seat. The NPD are probably going to win a seat. And so I think, I think it, we're going to see a slightly different European election campaign than we see in Germany. Before. Yeah. I mean, it's like you're putting a Germany far than I do, but I mean, yeah. that's my impression from the outside. Well, yes and no. I mean, of course, we, the jury is still out as to what the uh, impact will be of the financial crisis in Germany. Uh, well, on public opinion, we see it, but on, on election behavior uh, in the European parliamentary elections, we'll still have to see. Uh, there are doubts regarding the leadership uh, of the alternative for Deutschland. Uh, quite a lot of infighting going on, a rather chaotic um, um, party convention uh, just last week or last weekend. So. It, uh, but the flip side is the Grand Coalition. Yeah, and also determine on whether this is uh, whether this will continue to be this <coughs> one-man show uh, by Bernd Lucke, or whether there are actually more um, whether there's a, a bigger leadership. But if you're a slightly more Eurosceptic CDU CSU voter, and you want to go out in these elections and express that somehow, you you don't want to vote for the CDU. They won the last election. You're happy. They're now governing in Berlin, they're happy. So you want to use your vote to do something different. Who do you vote for in these elections? You don't necessarily care about the leadership of the party. The elections don't really matter. It's more signaling to, to Berlin, your views. And so that's what often has driven support. I mean, all of these parties are pretty chaotic. All of, you know, the, the questions over the leadership. So but vote, when it, when, if it's a national election, I absolutely agree with you. Much more high stakes. Voters are much more careful and care about leadership in these sort of things. So these elections, they're much happier just to go out and express some kind of opposition and not worry too much about what that means in the long run. So, that, you know, so even in the European election polls in Germany right now, they're running at around 7-8% of the polls, which, which will mean they'll, they'll get to the right seats. Actually, if I may, I actually had a question. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, I don't sure. want to monopolize. Um, but my... Um, so one of the, when reading your uh, work on the democratic deficit um, of the European Union, you were uh, always making the point that there's too little at stake in the European elections and that there's too little politicization, that there's too little um, influence on the election of top pol political personnel in the European Union. Uh -huh. uh, my question is, uh, do you see any sort of change now with the Lisbon Treaty in place and this new sort of uh, uh, procedure in place and are you I mean, do you see that back empirically, that there is a bigger sort of uh, salience, politicization, bigger interest? Uh, if I understood your talk uh, correctly, probably not. A little bit. I mean, the, I, I guess I'm, sort of, I, I'm hedging my bets a bit here. I, I'm very excited that this has actually happened. I think, it, you know, you have to start somewhere. And having different candidates from different party families in Europe is step one. Having much more high profile candidates with quite different policy positions that would, could be identifiable would be better than what we have. But this is definitely better than nothing. So, you know, and so for me, it's not about what happens this time, it's what's going to happen in five years. You got, it's going to take a long time. You want to rush everything very quickly. Maybe I'm just getting old. But we just, you know, <laughs> it, it's, you know, you've got, to think, you've got to think quite long term time horizons and, and how. You know, we look back at things that, that happened in the EU, and the European Parliament has always sort of nudged the governments to accept them. You know, we now all accept the European Parliament has, is a pretty powerful legislative institution, but it's not that long ago that it wasn't. It was purely just consultative, and the governments would say, never, ever, ever would the European Parliament be a, be a full-blown legislative institution. Now, everyone just accepts that, you know, most of what happens in the EU has to go with both through the Council and through the European Parliament. And we just accept it, right? So, and it's not taken that long to get to this. So, in a sense, I see this as a starting process, and, and it, I hope that either Schultz or Juncker, for good or ill, become the Commission President. Because then at least then they'll say, when it comes in five years' time, they're going to say, this is how it works now. The group 
The largest group in the European Parliament, their candidate is going to be Commission President. And then we're going to have to really take this seriously. And then people are going to throw their hats into the ring and we're going to see a real battle. But it has to start. So I think this is really a good start. It won't really transform the election this time. There'll be a little bit of a start. And quite a lot can happen between now and the elections. Will we see Sunday supplements of newspapers with pullouts of the candidates and, and sort of backstory profiles of them? I don't know. If we do, I think that would be a good thing. And I think, you know, we don't know yet. Are we going to see that in, uh, in Süddeutsche in Germany or in the, in the Guardian in Britain or in Le Monde? We, we might do. But I think we might see. Yes. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm from Italy. Uh, I was wondering if it's only one way, like the voters are more willing to take a risk in European <coughs> elections, or also the other way around, like this populist um, parties know that they have more chances to win places in the European elections, and also it's such a big deal for them in their manifesto, this Euroscepticism. And it, so they're putting more effort in the campaigns that the moderate parties are. That's right. I mean, it does. It's always it's always been the case. It's always been the case that more radical parties have tried to mobilize more of these elections than the mainstream parties have, and it's a it's a double effect. It's, they're spending much more on the campaign. It's interesting with Britain. Wednesday night this week is a live debate between Nick Clegg and Nigel Farage. There is, there's going to be two of them. So the leader of the, the deputy prime minister, the leader of the Lib Dems. He has nothing to lose because they could get white tapped in these European elections. Farage, he has nothing to lose. The two of them have both have everything to gain. They're not competing with each other's voters. Cameron and Miliband are just hoping the elections will go away. Clay and Farage are willing to do anything they can to make these elections matter because Clegg has to mobilise pro-European voters to go vote for him, Farage has to mobilise anti-European voters to go vote for him. So they, they, they both have a mutual interest to, to, to make these elections that count. And what's interesting, in very few other member states do you get the pro-Europeans wanting to mobilise in these elections to try and make it count against these radical or protest anti-Europeans because they know they're going to do badly and so they're, they're trying not to actually campaign. It, it's this interesting case because Everyone's assuming there is going to be a honeymoon period for Renzi. And so is Renzi going to do quite well in these elections, which could undermine Grillo? Is Grillo going to come second or is he going to come third? If he comes third, this could be damaging for him because he's been a kind of rising movement and he's now the... Renzi's done a deal with Berlusconi on a form of the electoral system, so Grillo is standing on sidelines and saying, see, I told you they're all the same. Yeah, but also in Italy, like Beppe Grillo was the first to talk about European elections. Yeah. It's, really, it's like really running for us, it's not second, secondary election. For us, it's really important. We want to be the yeah, more, much more than Renzi. Yeah, Renzi yeah. was saying, yeah, I don't want really to, <laughs> to be inside this. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, hello. Um, my question is, to what extent would you say that perhaps Merkel is secretly backing Schultz um, because of the coalition agreement and we have seen that as far as I know that Schultz was the head negotiator of the Social Democrats in the uh, coalition negotiations and what did the Social Democrats get? Nothing. Not really in the coalition agreement. Um, so I would I would see maybe there's kind of a brokering deal that because the CDU got most of their uh, no, most, most of the terms and most of the points into the agreement. I think the social, so, uh, SPD were in a very weak negotiating position. Uh, she'd done so well in those elections. She was bound to get much more than they were in those uh, negotiations. And, and, you know, I, I talked to a lot of German colleagues, including colleagues in Berlin, about exactly this. And you get different answers. Some people think that there's a deal for the back shots. Other people say, no, it's the last thing she wants. She, she can't come out in favour of Schultz because he's, he's from the SPD. She can't come out opposed to Schultz because he's German. So she, she just keeps quiet, some people say. Other people say she really doesn't like Schultz and the last thing she wants is a German presence of the commission. She was really bruised when she went to Athens and saw people doing Nazi salutes and carrying pictures of the EU flag with swastikas. Can you imagine what they would do if they have Merkel and a German commission president? So, you know, so she... There's a view. For, there's another view that says the last thing she wants is to have. She doesn't want a German commissioner. She doesn't want a German EU commissioner. I'm quite happy for there to be a German internal market or competition or one of the other portfolios. But she doesn't want 
Germany to play such a big role in the night. You want the EU to be making these decisions, not to be seen in Germany making these decisions. I mean, if Schultz, as Commission President, it's hard, much harder for America. That, I, to, to my ears, I'm hearing more of that kind of sentiment than I am of the, there's a secret deal to get Schultz. Right, you know, my word. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. yeah, I would have one more question regarding the candidates. Why, why do you think is, is Juncker being forced to be a candidate if he's so, so much against it? The one thing I read in German newspapers is that supposedly because he speaks German and he could, he could uh, challenge Schultz in German TV, but can they really be? Yeah. It might be something else. I it, it, it's very hard to know behind the scenes, and it's very hard to know whether or not it's just cheap talk from his side. It sounds good to, to be kind of, I don't really want the job, but for the good of the party, I'm going to put my name forward, and they've asked me to do it. And you know, he, he, there's, I don't know whether it's that, and he does want it, or whether um, you know they need somebody to put up against Schultz. They thought that, that it's better for him to do it. Uh, and if they have to have Schultz as Commission President, then at least they've got Juncker ready to then be perhaps President of the European Council. So, so you know, there's lots of potential arguments people make. We won't know until, after, until we see them all happen. In many ways, I think that it would be much easier. You guys, if the EPP emerges as the largest group in the European Parliament elections, and they might do, it's very tight. And my hunch right now is that the polls are slightly overestimating the socialists in France and in Germany and in the UK. They're big countries with lots of MEPs at stake. And so the EPP could sneak through as the largest group in the parliament. Also, the EPP are much more flexible than, than the socialists when it comes to doing deals with a bunch of dodgy parties from centuries to the earth. <laughs> you guys, you want to join the EPP? Sure. How many MEPs do you have? <laughs> the socialists can't do that kind of thing. So, so you know, my, they could well emerge. And then, in a sense, there could be a huge sigh of relief from the law of governments. Oh, thank God, it's not going to be sure. And then it could be Juncker, and they say, look, and then the governments will say, oh, we know that Juncker to be commission president. Martin, what else do you want? And they'll find some other thing. Perhaps a commissioner, perhaps they represent foreign affairs, something. Um, whereas if the socialists emerge as the biggest group, and you get a vote in that first parliament for Schultz, you can then see a real fight between the governments and the European parliament, because I think he only has a, he doesn't have majority support amongst the governments right now. There's not much sense about that. And, and I, then there then may well be a very nasty, messy deal to have somebody else impose on top. Yeah. Michael, what's your view of that? Uh, <laughs> You're so yes. used to being an official that you don't want to express your views. No, 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 I have, I have views, but you know, people have heard my views before. They're heavy to listen to you, not to me. And you know how much I can talk if you let, let me loose, you know. So it's better for me to shut up. Uh, I, I actually do think this possibility of a rather nasty struggle is, 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 is quite high because it's not so obvious. You know, there are the arguments you put for and against are very strong on both sides, and, and, and particularly if you just look at the big governments, and they are, you know, they don't like the look of Schulz and they don't like the look of Juncker, and, uh, and uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a real fight. But doesn't that support your view that you, the European Union needs great politicisation? Yes. So, in a, in a sense, that's what politics is about. It's not about people being nice and sitting around the table and so having a couple of beers and agreeing. It's actually people disagreeing rather a lot. So I actually think it would be a. Uh, well, it's it's problem. more you know it's not you know politics is both personalities and it's you know policy positions. Right. So so I mean it's important. I think we often underestimate the importance of personalities in these things. Most. Yeah. Citizens out there are not political wonks like we are. <laughs> you know, they're in. They're, they watch politics for the political soap opera of it. For the, you know, and that's what the political editors are selling to us on the nightly news show or the or the newspaper columns. It's the, you know, look who's up and who's down and who's within this person and who's out and who's in bed with so and so. I mean, that's what. That's our infotainment that sells politics to most of us as citizens. That's okay, it's a democracy. It was like that in Athens, it's like that today here. Why would it be any different, right? So, so for that, you need personalities, and we need to know who won and who lost. So we can look at them, and the person who lost can then say, well, I wouldn't be doing it differently, you know, and oh, uh, you know, look, they messed up there, and you've 
ahead of me. I that. That's part of politics, and I think that it's important to have personalities for that. But you need also there to be different policy positions. And so the two together, you need to try and think about how you get the two together, and then you get real politics. Hands are being held up here at great length, so I think you should let them in. First, yeah, if you'd like to, and second at the back, and third in the front. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Joseph. Joseph, I'm from Germany. And uh, regarding this issue about limiting free movement, I have the impression that the political discourse actually replaces the fear of foreigners taking away jobs with the fear of foreign, foreigners uh, immigrating into the social systems. So why is this the case? Yeah, and it, it's, uh, there's very little empirical evidence that there's any you know, benefit shock with this. That, British Day Mail likes to call it. There's, there's very little evidence, but this looks like this is real fear for, for particularly lower income voters. And it's interesting how in Britain, in the local elections uh, earlier uh, last year, UKIP suddenly broke through in a lot of parts of the country. And when pollsters tried to work out who was voting for them, they found there were three types of voters. There was um, the ex-British National Party, Guys, white underclass living in council estates, covering tattoos, doing drugs, voting for UKIP. An underclass in British society that were white rioters two years ago, about 4% of the electorate now vote UKIP. Then there's the old rural, we call them the Blue Rinse Brigade. Blue Rinse was a kind of blue hair guy of the 70 something old ladies who live in the country. Um, and they were, they don't like the fact that the Conservative Party are now these kind of cosmopolitan metrosexuals who have gay friends. Um, and, and, you know, the, you have, we have a Conservative government in Britain who passed gay marriage through the House of Commons. Uh, so they want to roll Britain back to the 50s and they think that, you know, UKIP represents that. And then there's another group, which is about 5% of the electorate, which are lower income voters competing for jobs with immigrants. And there are two, two trades in the UK. They're in the building trades, and they're now agricultural labour. UKIP had a breakthrough in a lot of rural areas, in Lincolnshire and Sussex, and this is because local farmers were hiring Polish and Lithuanian fruit pickers instead of local labour, local seasonal labour, who are, who are kind of seasonal, cash in hand, underclass, underemployed, and it was cheaper than just hire Polish and Lithuanians, and this is being noticed by. So these are people competing directly for jobs with immigrants. So you can just for a lot of the voters, for a lot of these voters, it's not. You know, it's only for five percent is it direct competition for jobs. For the old, for the other groups, it's the benefit scrounging they don't like. The white underclass, their main income source is benefits. The older class, the pensioners, the retirees, they don't like the idea of these benefit scroungers because that means they spend less money on pensions. Um, and so, you know, it, it's become an issue for, uh, for a lot of these parties to be able to bring together a coalition in support of this sort of particular group. group. And UKIP have these very clever posters in Britain. They say, um, say no to Europe, enough is enough. Which is both, you know, enough, no more European integration, but enough is enough, meaning no more immigrants. And so they managed to put the two issues together. And the two issues of immigration and Europe are now, for the first time, being put together in the minds of a lot of voters, particularly lower income voters. And benefits there is one issue where these parties cleverly know you're not going to get a change in the treaties. They're not going to change the treaties to say there isn't free movement of people. But you might get a change to the provisions on access to welfare benefits, which are there because of secondary legislation and uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice. So this could actually be changed without changing the treaties. And they very cleverly know that. And they know if they push on this, they can get mainstream parties to support, start to support that. And then they can go to the voters and say, see, we did it. See, you can vote for us, and we actually changed it. Yes, um, Hi, I'm Hannes. I'm from Germany. Um, sorry about free trade, do you think it's good or bad and how would it end the through the elections? Thank you. My wife's American, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> free trade with the US, I'm only favourable. Um, <laughs> my kids are dual nationalities. Uh, in general, you know, I, it's, it's interesting, it's going to be much harder to do a deal between Europe and the US than I think a lot of people assume at priori. 
Because most free trade agreements are, are done between countries that don't compete with each other in the same products. So they say, I agree to sell my products to you, and you agree to sell your products to me, and we do a deal. It became more difficult with Korea, uh, particularly you know, manufacturing in southern Italy, particularly in, in Italy, for example, particularly opposed to it. Um, but the US, it, we're basically trading the same goods with each other. And so we are competing with each other on a lot of products that we currently have captured various markets on. The latest fight is over labeling of cheese. Because the Americans manufacture Parmesan, feta, Munster, and the like. And we manufacture Parmesan in Parma and feta in Greece. And you know, so we have these origin rules. The US is saying, okay, free trade, let's get rid of these origin rules. <laughs> right? And massive lobby in the US of, of the food manufacturers to, to say, oh, we can't accept European origin rules, then we'll have to change all our labeling to say Parmesan like cheese, feta <laughs> like cheese. Or, you know, so it's going to be much trickier than people realize, I think, to, to, to get this deal done. And it could end up being really watered down to something not as significant. If we could do it, if we could do it based on mutual recognition of common standards, we have pretty high standards, health and safety standards, environment standards in both markets. Yeah, we might be snooty about a few things the Americans do, and the Americans are snooty about a few things we do that they think they do better. But overall, in the great scheme of things, our standards are globally above pretty much everybody else's between the two of us. And so if we can come to agreements, mutual recognition of standards as part of a package deal, this will have enormous implications both in terms of us being able to set global market standards much higher. China will then have to adopt this kind of TTIP standard to be part of the global standard. So will it play a role in the elections? I don't think so. But I think it's going to play a big role in politics of the European Parliament over the next five years. Right, yes, sorry, there was someone down the front. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, oh, um, you mentioned. Um, How about just saying if you're not from Germany? So you mentioned the reluctance of the big parties, so centre right, centre left, national parties, to make real efforts at these elections. Could you speak that, maybe? Yeah. Um, but the no. <laughs> just just speak. We have ambient noise. Go on. <laughs> I'll try to speak loud. Um, so in the um, elections in France, there was, I think, a voting turnout of 38%. And I just don't really understand why the parties would make a bigger effort. Because this just seems to me like they think they're going to be re-elected anyhow because they're the center of parties. And as if the politicians just accept that they failed on a more personal level. And that they're just going to be replaced, but that the party is still going to be in power, probably, in the next national election. Okay. Why, why don't the mainstream parties make more of an effort in these elections? Several reasons. Why, look, for them, it's not that important. These are the parties who expect to form government or to battle for forming government at the national level. That's the elections they care about more than anything. And in the other the first thing, number two, elections are getting more and more expensive for parties. And they all want to save their money for the big general election. In Germany, the parties have now spent all their money in the general election. There's not a lot left. In Britain, the parties are saving up desperately for the next general election a year from now. They don't want to spend anything on this European election. Only UKIP and the Lib Dems are going to spend anything on this election. Um, and so, you know, they're just thinking. So we do badly in these elections. So the extremists do well. And there's a low turnout. Well, then we can just go away. Look, it was a low turnout. Who cares? They're not relevant. So they, you know, there's not big incentives for them to really mobilize in these elections. And in fact, the lower the turnout, the easier it is for them to say it doesn't particularly matter. And it's not a good indication of what's going to happen in the real election we care about, which is a year away or two years away or whatever. But isn't this basically about not tackling the real issues that are the reason why these parties are gaining voters. Which I, you could easily do, I think, in, in, on TV or in, just in the media to challenge these arguments that the public parties are. Yeah, but look, I wouldn't vote for any of these parties, but these are legitimate concerns 
that these parties are expressing about legitimate groups in society that are feeling marginalised because of the direction of European integration and the direction of globalisation and growing income inequality and you name it, reform of the state and austerity and, you know, so these are, it, it, it's healthy that we have um, room in our democratic politics for these parties to actually win votes and the debate will then start about what to do if these parties break through. I actually think, ironically, it's better for the legitimacy of the EU that these parties get elected and sit in the European Parliament. Because then, yes, they're in the European Parliament. You can say, no voice for extremists. Actually, a lot of these guys, we might, be, they, we might think they're unsavory, but they're actually representing the views of a lot of citizens out there. <coughs> and if they're representing the European Parliament, this ironically could give, allow the European Parliament to claim a bit more legitimacy than it current has, currently has in the minds of a lot of voters in Europe. Right. I think that Simon has done a sterling work, but I will have one more, one more question. Yes. You're, you're, yes, you're the lucky man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you better be good. <laughs> Pressure's on. Yes. Uh, I'm just saying half Italian, half English, or that correct in Italy. Yeah. Um, I see that we've been talking about these uh, populist parties in the and they're rising across Europe. Do you feel that in many ways they might um, uh, halt or uh, create problems for the process of uh, European integration overall. But this doesn't necessarily mean on an economic level, but also on a political level, cultural even. Do you feel that they could actually stop this process from going as fast as it is, or do it have any influence? I, I think there's a mainstream consensus that uh, whenever there's a problem, <coughs> European integration is the solution to the problem. And I think it's not clear to a lot of excluded groups in society that that necessarily is, is the solution. And that needs to be, you know, so there needs to be more open debate about that. And particularly when you think about what is happening. Crisis in economic and monetary union, and what is being built is really genuinely quite profound new political architecture that's being built of deeper economic and monetary union. Bailout funds worth over a trillion euros. This is potentially redistribution of wealth across borders in Europe. Yes, you can say it's temporary because it's low, but in the minds of people having paying their taxes, it's not. Are they? There's no guarantees they get back. The second pillar: austerity packages and having to reform your local. Uh, Brussels is going to police what you can borrow, what you spend, and we're going to have to reform our our, our, our public spending regimes domestically. Who gives these guys the right to tell us to do that? We elect a government here that does that. It's a fundamental shift from, from what was built to now. So up to now, Europe was in a sense a microeconomic union, a single market on a continental scale created and regulated in Brussels. Now what is being built is a macroeconomic union. It's something qualitatively different. And for a lot of voters, they're looking at this and saying, I didn't vote for this. How did this happen? So I think it's a legitimate question people are asking. And a lot of this stuff is getting passed through votes in parliaments and by grand coalitions. There's, there has not been referendums on this new architecture that's been built. There's not been a new treaty that this has been put into that's then ratified through a parliament. This is being done in a sense through the back door. And I think it, it's then a clear argument this is not being built in, with as much and as widespread democratic support as, for example, the single market. And so, so I, do, I do think these, these guys are onto something. On that uh, slightly dark note, <laughs> I think uh, uh, I hope you will join with me in thanking Simon for what I thought was a masterly performance, both in his talk and in his readiness to answer your questions. I know he's not answered everybody's question, but all those who ask questions, he's, I think, responded to extremely fully. And even if you might not have agreed with everything he said, I'm sure he'd be happy if he didn't agree with everything he said. But I, I really feel you gave everything that you've got, Simon, and I really appreciate your coming. Thank you.